A man always wanted to fly. Today we know how to do it, while before this issue was not as obvious. To make wings like the birds have, or to screw into the air, both variants seemed quite natural. Finally, the first variant led to creation of an airplane, while the second of a helicopter. Prototypes of a helicopter were found in the remote ages. Go Hun, the Chinese scientist of the 4th century and the great Leonardo da Vinci of the 15th century, both proposed their versions of a helicopter. The genius Mikhail Lomonosov also worked in this sphere. In 1754 he built an aerodromic machine, which was nothing else than a small-sized helicopter. Of course, it did not fly, but experiments helped developing ideas which predetermined all further helicopter construction. At the dawn of aviation, the idea of building a helicopter attracted a lot of minds. From making models, they rushed to build natural size machines. However, with the energy of their muscles, they could only push the toe pedals, joining the army of losers. Human strength alone was not enough to fly. The steam engine available at that time could not help, since it was too heavy. The first internal combustion engines were heavy either. Therefore, all helicopters built before the 20th century remained on the ground. An important event in the helicopter construction history happened on August 24, 1907, when engineer Volumar took off for the first time on a rotary wing machine, which was called the Giroplane. It was designed by a French engineer, Louis Breguet. The Giroplane took off to a height of over a meter and stood there for about a minute. To achieve even such modest results, the machine was made maximum light. It had no controls. Mechanics kept the Giroplane from rolling over. This flight was said to be unmanned, while the first helicopter pilot is deemed to be Paul Cornu, who in autumn of the same 1907 lifted a machine of his own design to a height of 30 centimeters. Rather successful in Russia was a student from Kiev, Igor Sikorsky. In 1910, his machine got off the ground, marking both enormous achievements and huge problems. Aircraft, which were more simple from the point of view of dynamics, by that time gained impressive success, becoming completely worthy machines. Helicopter, on the contrary, disappointed the mechanic flight business enthusiasts. In reality, this proved the basic assumption that development of a helicopter was a much more difficult business than development of an aircraft. Nevertheless, all the main helicopter layouts were indeed created at the dawn of the 20th century. The first and the most obvious layout was the one with the single rotor. But tests showed that with the winding rotor, the machine itself starts moving in the opposite direction. Creation of a tail rotor as solution of the torque reaction problem was offered in 1911 by Boris Yuryev, a student of the Royal Technical School. Since the main rotor was single, the layout was called the single rotor layout. Another way to cancel the torque reaction was application of two rotors winding in opposite directions. Their mutual placement gave birth to several layouts. Tandem, side-by-side, multi-rotor, and coaxial. There is another layout which looks like coaxial, but in fact it is a side-by-side -side layout with a maximum converged rotor axis. 
rotors are synchronized, therefore such machines are called the synchropters. But the layout selection is only a beginning. A special mechanism is required to control the flight. One of them, which later became classical, was proposed by Boris Yuryev and was called the wobbly plate. It is responsible for the propeller blade angle against the air stream. It is also called the blade pitch. The more is the blade pitch, the higher is the lifting. If the blade pitch is changed synchronically, the helicopter will go vertically, either up or down. So we are up. Now let's fly. Where to? Forward at least. In this case, the blade pitch should not change synchronically. This is how the direction and the speed are set. The mechanism changing the blade pitch was not the only puzzle. A simple enumeration of all the technical novelties would not reflect the revolutionary work performed by the helicopter construction pioneers. Development of the rotary wing machines promised to resolve the tasks which were beyond any capabilities of the aircraft or air balloons. What's important, a helicopter stopped being an aircraft competitor and became its adequate supplement. All this brought new interest to helicopters. Designers around the world set to resolve complicated and interesting tasks relating to its development. Only in Russia, research in this sphere did not progress first due to revolution and then to the Civil War. Only in 1929, the first of the USSR rotary wing machine was built by young engineers Nikolai Kamov and Nikolai Skrzynski. They were inspired by the works of a Spanish engineer Juan de la Sierra, who in the beginning of the 20s invented an interesting machine, the Autogiro, something between an airplane and a helicopter. This machine gets started as an airplane with a propeller engine in front. The other propeller on top, winding under the incoming stream, creates the lift. This mode is called the auto-rotation. Autogiro, unlike the airplane, is not afraid of losing speed and, in the event of the engine failure, can land safely. Juan de la Sierra created its machine as a more safer version of an airplane. But it was not yet a helicopter, since it could not hover. Kamov and Skrzynski called their Autogiro the Kasker. It was built on the funds of the Aviation Association, but the leading force was enthusiasm of its designers. Kasker took off in 1929, while in 1931 the Autogiro topic was seriously taken up by the Tsagi. Under the supervision of Alexei Cheryomukhin, there was a group formed to develop special layouts, comprising design team of Vyacheslav Kuznetsov, Kamov and Skorzynski. The theoretical calculations team was headed by Mikhail Mil. Starting from 1931, this design bureau produced a number of autogiros. The most renowned was A7, a gigantic dragonfly. It's an autogiro. It can take off and land without taking a run. It can easily land on a flat roof of a building. The autogiro is piloted by Comrade Koshitz. Machine had its practical application. In the beginning of 1941, thousands of hectares of the Tenshine Gardens were invaded by pests. 
Agricultural airplanes could not be used due to narrow valley gorges, while Autogiro did not require any takeoff and landing strips. A7 easily maneuvered in the gorges going down into the valleys, turning round and climbing up again to reach areas unreachable for airplanes. Tests and operations of Autogiro's help designers of the rotary wing machine to master specifics of the flight aerodynamics and to learn how to calculate durability. Autogiro played the same role in the life of helicopter as the glider in the history of airplane. But let's get back to the beginning of the 30s. In spite of the Autogiro topic perspective, helicopter development never stopped. As far back as in 1926, a helicopter group was formed in Sagi, headed by Alexei Chiryomukhin. After fundamental analysis, the group started to develop the first Soviet helicopter Tsagi 1 EA, which stood for experimental machine. It was based on the single rotor layout. The rotor torque reaction was cancelled by four tail rotors placed in pairs in front and rear. The prototype took off in September 1930. The designer himself was the test pilot. On August 14, 1932, Chiryomuhin lifted his helicopter to 605 meters, exceeding the official altitude world record by more than 33 times. It was an outstanding success. Mikhail Tukhachevsky, who was then responsible for the rearmament of the Red Army, was fascinated. Being a supporter of novelties in the army, he suggested to put Tsagi-1 into production. However, the layout reliability and flight duration required long improvement. While it was being performed, Alexei Chiryomuhin was announced enemy of the nation, dismissed from his work, and in 1938 got under repressions. In 1933, all design works in Tsagi on the helicopter topic were headed by young engineer Ivan Bratuhin. The Tsagi 5 helicopter was made under his supervision. It differed from its predecessors by the rotor design. Next machine was Tsagi 11, built in 1936. It was combined layout. Besides the rotor, it had an airplane wing, at the end of which there were propellers. This machine was supposed to take off as a helicopter and then fly as an airplane. Such layout was defined as rotor wing. Tests of this machine were not completed. Development of the rotor wing machines of various layouts went on all over the world. The aviation science and technology progress was adequate for the development of a worthy helicopter. The first helicopters with applicable flight characteristics were the French Brigadoran, and the German Focke Wolf 61. The latter was especially fascinating. Built under the guidance of Heinrich Focke, it turned out capable of performing long-range flights. The side-by-side -side layout provided it with enough stability and controllability. Abilities of this machine were demonstrated by the famous German woman pilot Hanna Reich. The flights were even more fascinating since they were performed inside the indoor Deutschland Halle Stadium. The German military command got so much fascinated that it ordered a six-seat version of this machine. 
The multi-purpose Fokke Ahgelis 223 was put into production in the middle of the war. At the same time, Germany started to issue a light Flettner 282 helicopter. It had a layout of a synchropter. Those were real achievements of the German helicopter development. However, those machines never had any mass presence at the fronts of the Second World War. The factories did not manage to perform their production due to Anglo-American bombings. The Russian immigrant aircraft designer Igor Sikorsky gained huge success in the USA in the sphere of the rotor wing machine's production. Later, he was honorably called the father of the world helicopter development. His prototype VS-300 was a single rotor layout based with the tail rotor. By 1941, Sikorsky made it operational. The single rotor layout became classical. Over 90% of all helicopters were built upon such a layout. The two-seat S-47 Sikorsky helicopters entered service in the U.S. and the British armies already in the course of the war. From March 1944, they were utilized for withdrawing the wounded, performing communication, surveillance, units and vessel supply matter. After the end of the war, there appeared a paradox. Helicopters seemed to prove their right for existence. However, orders for their production were significantly cut. The U.S. Army and Navy Command doubted whether it was expedient to invest scanty after-war funds into the rotor-wing aviation. Indeed, characteristics of the first helicopters, especially their payload and speed, were poor in comparison with those of airplanes. No orders came from the businesses either. They did not hurry to pay for the unusual aircraft, which was more expensive, difficult in maintenance, and not much reliable. Helicopters' appearance at the fronts of the Second World War did not stay unnoticed in the USSR. Funds were allocated to Ivan Bratuhin's design bureau. This design bureau was established before the war in January 1940 and already then managed to build a helicopter called Omega. It was based on the side-by-side -side layout, the same as of the German Focke Wolf 61. However, problems discovered that tests were not resolved as successfully as the Germans did. Omega took off in August 1941. Thereafter, the Bratuchin's team was evacuated, then returned back, then there were problems with the engines. So the designer began to deal with helicopters only by the end of the war. In 1944, Omega-2 took off. In 1945, there came the upgraded G-3 artillery spotter version, which turned to be rather successful. Helicopter, Helicopter a wingless aircraft, designed by the Stalin Prize winner engineer Bratuchin. This aircraft can take off without a run from any spot, a building roof or a piece of ice. It will have great future in the civil aviation and national economy. The first training air squadron was formed of those machines. Although pilots flew within the limits of the airdrome at low altitude and minor speed, Attitude toward helicopters was ironic and relaxed, and more often suspicious. How this thing could fly without the wing? Wondered pilots coming to fly helicopters after mastering several types of aircraft. 
But this did not stop Bartuchin. In 1945, his design bureau started to develop a whole series of helicopters of different designations. All of them were based on the same side-by-side -side layout. Aerodynamics was improved by substituting truss structure for a wing. Different types of fuselage were supposed to be suspended under it depending on the tasks performed. There came different machines one after another. The B-5 passenger machine. The B-9 ambulance. The B-10 airborne surveillance unit. The B-11 liaison version. However, works went through hardships. One of the prototypes crushed. Test pilot Konstantin Ponomarev and radio operator Igor Nilus died. This produced a negative impact on the design bureau's reputation and it was closed in spring 1951. Progress in this unknown direction was slow because helicopter development topic was not even among the first ten in the list and funding was therefore scanty. The side-by-side -side layout chosen by Bratuchin was not simple. It required time and money. In the beginning of 1945, works on helicopters were started in one of the leading design bureaus of Alexander Yakovlev. The successful wartime designer thought he would manage to cope with helicopters as well. The layout chosen for the prototype machine seemed to be simple, coaxo. When the work assignment was received in the design bureau, someone asked, Is it a joke? The head of the team replied, No, this is serious. We shall design a helicopter and will give it a definition J, a joke. The very first test flights brought numerous helicopter problems to designers. The coaxial layout was too complicated. So Yakovlev decided to try a more simple layout proven successful on American helicopters. His single rotor Yak-100 built in 1948 resembled one of the earlier Sikorsky helicopters. The three-seat machine demonstrated good flight characteristics and was recommended for the combat service. However, by that time, a similar helicopter designed by Mikhail Mil was already in production. It was decided inexpedient to produce two similar machines. Mikhail Mil was dealing with the rotor wing machine since the 30s. After the war in Sagi, he designed and built a natural-sized helicopter assembly. It was so well done that represented, in fact, a ready helicopter. Therefore, on December 12, 1947, a governmental resolution was issued on the establishment of the Mill Design Bureau as an independent helicopter-producing institution. The first product of this design bureau was MI-1 light helicopter. The small three-seat machine took off in September 1948, piloted by Matvey Baikalov. Tests were dramatic. The first two prototypes crushed. While there were no victims in the first accident, in the second, test pilot Baikalov died. In spite of the failures, the young designer's team managed to make MI-1 operational. Although difficulties continued, the first series consisted of 15 helicopters, but producing even such a minor amount was not an easy task. 
With great difficulties, the first Mi-1 prototypes were assembled at the Moscow helicopter factory. They were immediately introduced at the Tushina Air Show. The country leadership was attending. Attention is drawn by these strange aircraft. They have no wings. The rotor is above the cabin. They take off vertically. These are Soviet helicopters designed by engineer Mill. However, even after such a show, the aircraft producing factories were reluctant to develop the strange and non-reputable equipment. The army did not insist, while the civil aviation did not express any interest to the helicopter at all. In order to overcome indifference, in summer 1951, enthusiasts of the new equipment organized a show specially for Joseph Stalin. MI-1 flew to the leader's country house in Sochi and showed unique takeoff and landing characteristics in the mountains. Just like anything new, helicopters' way to recognition was no simple. Works on the rotor wing machine were resumed after the war by Nikolai Kamov. First of all, he managed to introduce helicopter specialization in the aircraft construction faculty of the Moscow Aviation Institute. The first Kamov students became his supporters. Luck came when the USSR Navy Command backed up the KA-8 Superlight helicopter project. The small designers group started their work and in autumn 1947 the helicopter was made. Kamov named it the Irkutyanin in honor of his birthplace. The one-seat KA-8 belonged to the superlight class, the so-called flying motorbikes. Its takeoff weight was only 320 kilograms. In other countries, helicopters of such a weight category were made upon a twin rotor coaxial layout. They were compact with good payload and seamed perspective. However, the layout was not simple. Tests showed ground resonance problems and flatter, in other words, vibration might cause helicopters destruction. Those were not the last problems faced by the young team. 1948 was not the best year for experiments. The Soviet aviation industry was under severe personnel reduction. According to the order of June 1, 1948, funding of KA-8 was terminated. Probably we would have never heard of Kamov anymore if it had not been for the Stalin's son Vasily, who was commander of the Moscow Aviation District and a big fan of technical sports. He took Kamov's group under his patronage, placed it in one of the military units and ordered to get ready for the air parade. In August 1948 in Tushina, pilot Mikhail Gurov brilliantly took off and landed Irkutyanin on board of a truck. Commenting the KA-8 flight, the announcer pronounced the word helicopter for the first time. In September of the same year, the Kamov Design Bureau was officially established. At first, the team was assigned to develop an improved KA-10 version on the basis of KA-8. Its first flight took place in August 1949. Like with MI-1, not everything went smooth. A catastrophe occurred in which test pilot Mikhail Gurov died. It was the third victim among helicopter test pilots. Helicopters were not easy. Passing tests on ships, KA-10 did not suit the Navy command. Kamov tried to develop an improved version of the same helicopter. But it was too early to speak of any helicopter's practical application. The main point was, 
that the first machines brought indispensable experience. In the meantime, a helicopter boom burst out in the USA. It was based on Sikorsky's machine's success. The interest of many designers and businessmen was such that by the end of the 40s, there were over 300 helicopter producing companies in the country. Machines were of different layout and size. This resembled the overall fancy for airplanes of the beginning of the century. Of course, not everyone managed to leave its name in the helicopter development history. Successful were such companies as Bell & Hiller, which following Sikorsky picked up the classical single rotor layout. For over 20 years, the light, Bell 47 and Hiller 360 were the best in their class. In the more heavier class, Sikorsky remained authority number one. But there were others as well. Frank Pisetsky, an immigrant from the Russian Empire, managed to develop the world-first operational twin-rotor side-by-side layout helicopter. Many designers tried to use the same layout later on. Tests revealed typical problems relating to the rotor's harmful mutual impact. This limited piloting characteristics, a minor charge for the obvious advantages, large payload and voluminous fuselage. Not all of the designers who had chosen the side-by-side -side layout managed to repeat Pesetsky's success. The Charles Kamen's Syncropter was also put into production. Although the layout had a lot of problems, the helicopter had an obvious advantage. It was compact and very suitable for ship basing. Gradually, American military commanders obtained confidence in helicopter. More and more applications for the rotor wing machines were discovered. The number of civil orders were growing gradually as well. The Korean War became a radical test for the American helicopters of the first generation. It was a kind of a huge test range where the Cold War enemies tested their new weapons. Helicopters became one of the Korean War discoveries. They were used for reconnaissance, artillery spotting, communication, unit supply, withdrawal of wounded, rescue of the shot down pilots. What was most important, helicopters proved to be an efficient improvement of the ground forces' mobility. As one general said, helicopters turned combined arms into 3D operations. The army, suspiciously looking at helicopters at the beginning, now quickly turned into their rampant supporters. Such success of the rotor-winged equipment was not left unnoticed in the Soviet Union. In the end of September 1951, the leading Soviet aircraft designers were called to Kremlin. It was a regular conference, but with a surprising agenda. Elimination of the gap in the helicopter's production. The change of attitude toward the rotor wing machines was caused by the Korean War. Stalin considered further absence of helicopters in the armed forces dangerous for the country's defense capacity. Heads of the country's leading design bureaus were invited to the historic conference. Tupolev and Delusion, referring to huge workload, managed to escape getting assignments for the unusual aircraft. Mill offered the project of a transport helicopter to carry 12 soldiers. Kamov proposed a helicopter with a twice as much payload. Stalin ordered helicopters to be built within one year. When Kamov argued the timing as unrealistic, the project was passed over to Yakovlev. The latter knew well that the timing was unrealistic, but being more experienced in the Kremlin relationships, 
he did not dare objecting. Since that time, helicopters obtained green light in the USSR. Helicopter programs stood at the same level of importance as the nuclear and rocket project. Right after the conference, the dubious situation with MI-1 cleared up. It was put into mass production with more and more factories attached. A total of 2,700 MI-1 were built. MI-1 operations laid the basis for the Soviet rotor wing aviation. This helicopter was used not only in the army units, but in the air schools and air clubs. There was an attempt to equip MI-1 with anti-tank missile. This helicopter was utilized in the civil aviation as well. You can see vineyards of the Crimea. This is MI-1, an air rover of wide recognition. This time it is an agricultural machine. At a low speed, this minor worker flies over the mountain slopes, diligently sprinkling vineyards with chemicals. Fishermen could trace whales with the help of helicopters. Flight characteristics of this machine allow to set 27 world records. In the course of its operation, MI-1 was continuously modernized. New versions brought new capabilities. Helicopters did not escape attention of the cinema makers. In the feature film, The Striped Journey, MI-1 carried a lion tamer to a vessel occupied by wild cats. Where is the tiger? I will tame it. I'm not a coward, but I'm afraid. You are no tiger, you are a swine. Today we don't see anything unusual in the helicopters shown on the screen, while at that time it was a real curiosity. Things were down the road, and when the country's leaders ordered a new, much heavier machine, the Mills team got to work. In autumn 1951, the Design Bureau obtained an important production basis at its disposal, the factory in Sokolniki. In autumn 1952, nine months after the Kremlin conference, MI-4 took off, piloted by test pilot Sevolotvinitsky. The machine's characteristics were even higher than those prescribed in the state assignment. Without completing the tests, the helicopter was put into mass production. These machines are already familiar to the audience. The first helicopter group is led by Colonel Yarofeyevsky. Such machines were compared with dragonflies. It must be a rather primitive comparison. The helicopter cabin is spacious enough to accommodate people and different cargo. A car driver is relaxed, admiring the Moscow landscape. Throughout 12 years of the MI-4 production, a total of 3,200 machines with over 30 modifications were made. The helicopter proved to be of high demand. Anti-submarine, passenger, agricultural, forestry, rescue, polar, reconnaissance, ambulance, homing, mine setting, attack, it had so many versions. Different modifications brought a unique experience in satisfying various customers' requirements. 
MI4 was even ordered by the first secretary Nikita Khrushchev. Impressed by the flights in America on the President Eisenhower's helicopter, Nikita Khrushchev ordered a rotor wing machine for himself. Helicopter's demonstration to the high-ranking customer was made right in Kremlin. The armed Mi-4 became the first Soviet serial firing support helicopter. In the course of several decades, Mi-4 was utilized in the national economy, making the basis of the civil rotor wing aviation. Helicopters delivered geologists to difficult-to-access places, brought supplies to oil fields, worked on numerous construction sites as flying cranes, transported passengers. Work was more than enough. A number of unique experiments were conducted on MI4, such as the rotor blades blow off, which provided for the crew safe emergency escape. Radical changes occurred in the blades production technology, the most important element of the helicopter rotor system. The wooden blade substitution for metal construction could be compared with the transition to an all-metal machine in the aircraft production. The blade resource grew up from 150 to two and a half thousand hours. Thanks to MI-1 and MI-4, the USSR in the 50s obtained the powerful helicopter fleet capable of performing significant tasks. Besides the Soviet Union, the MIL helicopters operated in more than 30 countries of the world. The MI-4 development experience helped the Yakovlev Design Bureau. As was said before, Yakovlev could not refuse the assignment from Kremlin. Its heavy assault transportation helicopter was based upon the twin rotor tandem layout. The helicopter was called Yak-24 and it was regarded as a doubled MI-4. With practically no changes, the MI-4 dynamic system was used, including the rotor, the wobbly plate, the main gearbox, and the power plant. Yak-24 had a long, almost square section fuselage, which gave it a nickname, a flying wagon. The world's largest for its time rotor wing machine could not leave anybody indifferent. Just look how it worked. A helicopter flew its way when it saw a friend in trouble. How can it give any help? Helicopters can do this work easy enough.
holds the first Soviet world record. Pilots Georgi Tinikov and Yegor Milutichev pulled four tons to an altitude of 3,000 meters. But nothing is perfect. Yakovlev did not manage to resolve problems of the tandem layout and dropped this difficult task. Its design bureau turned to a more simple and habitual business airplane design. After making 40 Yak-24 machines, the project was wrapped up. Thus, there were only two helicopter design bureaus left in the Soviet Union, the Mills, making helicopters upon the classical layout, and the Kamovs, working upon the coaxial layout. In spite of the fact that Kamov did not get any assignment from Kremlin, he did not stop making new machines. The designer obtained certain support from the Naval Aviation Command, which needed a ship-based helicopter. Thus, upon their assignment, a two-seat KA-15 was built. It had to search for and destroy the enemy submarines, establish communication, perform reconnaissance, artillery spotting and rescue. In 1953, this machine performed its first flight piloted by Dmitry Yefremov. Tests were full of work. Apart from traditional helicopter problems, the coaxial layout has its own specific problems. For example, the danger of blades crossing, since the rotors wind in opposite directions. But the game was worth the candle. KA-15 had the same payload as MI-1, but it was twice lighter. It had more advantages at ship basing. The KA-15 coaxial layout was less sensitive to rolling and side winds. For designers, work on this helicopter turned into a great school of resolving problems typical for the coaxial layout machines. In the course of KA-15 modernization in the beginning of 1956, a four-seat version was built. It was defined as KA-18. Improvements touched upon fuselage and power plant. Surprising enough, but Kamov and Mill managed to achieve impressive results within a relatively short time. The Mill's helicopters enjoyed mass utilization in both the national economy and the army. The first Kamov helicopters were not yet, in fact, operating machines. But one should not forget that among the helicopter's layouts, the coaxial is one of the most complicated. Not so many designers in the world managed to develop an efficient machine with such a layout. The Kamov's machine proved that the chosen path was correct. Most important was that both designers, Mill and Kamov, obtained fundamental experience which they could use in future developments. The plans were to equip helicopters with more powerful gas turbine engines instead of piston engines. They already existed and the task was only to put them on helicopters. This could open a fascinating perspective. <laughs>